From the Foundation Studio right here on Biloxi's Back Bay, I want to welcome you to Super Talk Outdoors, where we celebrate every single Monday at lunchtime. The world-class outdoors of the state of Mississippi, because Mississippi is the capital of the outdoors in America. I want to thank you for joining us on the powerful Super Talk Mississippi Radio Network or on Super Talk TV at Seaspire TV. Or you might be watching the show on YouTube or Facebook or listening on your favorite podcast. It's September the 25th, 2023. By the way, my views on my show are mine, not those of the foundation. When it comes to outdoors and outdoors issues, you can count on me to say what needs to be said. And I have to tell you, I do it every week. I'm honored to be in this position. Uh, I especially want to thank the title sponsor for Super Talk Outdoors, the foundation. The formal name is the Foundation for Mississippi Wildlife Fisheries and Parks. They are actually a separate 5013 Outdoors Foundation that is uh, focused on supporting the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. And through their financial support, there are some really important wildlife and uh, educational projects that are associated with the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks that are made possible. Uh, the foundation also, as I'm, as I'm quick to point out, is also really involved in protecting Mississippi's outdoor heritage. And um, I've seen, uh, I've seen that their work, and they are such a dedicated list of volunteers who are working so hard uh, from time to time, even focused on issues that are important to that outdoor legacy. And I might also add that they are stronger and more aligned than they have ever been at this moment. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm profoundly honored and grateful that I get a time, I get the, uh, to spend time here on Super Talk Outdoors every single Monday with, with people who are close to and who, who deeply covet the outdoors. So many of the guests that are on my show have literally dedicated their lives to protecting and conserving the natural resources that we are so fortunate to enjoy here in the state of Mississippi. They educate us and they, they lose sleep sometimes at night when uh, special interests and politics try to get in the way of what is best for the majority of Mississippi outdoorsmen and women. But there's one of that, but I have to be honest, that's one of the reasons why Super Talk Outdoors is here. And uh, I like to say that I have the back of the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks employees, and I appreciate what they do. And I will always stand up for what I believe is right. Um, listen, I had a great time in the Mississippi Delta this weekend with my brother from another mother, Terry Waldrop. We checked on our hunting ground there and did a bunch of work at our farms in Chula, checking, you know, cutting roads and food plots and doing some spraying. Uh, planning starts in earnest next weekend. Honestly, I really needed a dose of the Mississippi Delta. As, as I've reported before, my mother had a long uh, medical challenge over the past year and unfortunately passed away last month. And so, you know, getting to the Mississippi Delta for me was a great opportunity for me to kind of get in touch with my soul. That's that's what the Mississippi Delta does for me. Um, you know, the reality is that um, this place, Mississippi, is a, is a special place, and one of the reasons why I call it the capital of the outdoors is because whether you're hunting or fishing or just taking in the sunsets and the sunrises, whether here on the Mississippi Gulf Coast or up in the Mississippi Delta, up in northeast Mississippi or in the Piney Woods, it's special. And uh, and uh, like I say, it's a great place to to find and and come in contact with with, with your soul. Uh, by the way, I posted some. Uh, uh, we posted a a quick reel at the Super Talk Outdoors Facebook page. If you want to see some scenes from from the last weekend, and while you're there, like our page and uh, stay in touch with the content that we that we post from time to time. Incidentally, Terry and I actually joined OJ Big Daddy at Big Daddy Soul Food there. Uh, at Big Daddy Soul Food and Barbecue there in, in Chula, that dude has mastered smoked chicken and ribs. Uh, good Lord. Uh, and the service there is just just phenomenal. Uh, and we love visiting with uh, Big Daddy. But uh, if you're ever near there, stop by and tell them that Super Talk Outdoors said hello. Okay, now let's shift gears. I'm really looking forward to catching up with my next guest. 
someone who was on the show uh, relatively recently, Andrew Ornette, who's the new head of the alligator program at the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. And we're going to we're going to talk about the wrap up of the season and whether whether there were record alligators ca uh, uh, caught this year. We'll, we'll we'll cover the spectrum. Anyway, without any further ado, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. It's good to see you again, man. It's good to see you. you're sitting at the at the main uh, office, I guess, in Jackson. I am. Yeah, that that's a that's a nice location for a headquarters, isn't it? It is. We have a we have a nice building there. You know, to the, the, the think about what our forefathers did to set aside that much land right there close to the city of Jackson. It's pretty cool, isn't it? It is. So, a Andrew, tell me how how's the season go? Actually, the season went really well. Um, we had a total of 1,006 alligators reported harvested, and that includes private and public waters. Uh, those numbers are up from last year. What, what, what did we have last year? Uh, last year's total harvest was 972. I mean, over 1,000 alligators, that's pretty good. That means more people are enjoying getting out there and and uh, and and I mean that's a that's a fun that's a fun sport to to be involved in, isn't it? It is. So uh, so when you look at the uh, the alligator population across the state of Mississippi, is it looking good? Yes, the alligator population is holding strong, and uh, it looks very healthy. How often did you get to get out? I got out both weekends that it was open on public waters, and got out some. Uh, during the time that the private land season was open as well. Were there any records this year? We did. We broke a state record for length. It was a 14-foot, 3-inch male. Um, got a phone call about that. Uh, opening night, Friday night. And, uh, well, actually, let me rephrase that. I got in probably around 5 a.m. that Saturday morning of opening weekend. I've uh, been out all day, all night, and woke up, I don't know, about 8.30, could have swore it was 11 o'clock, and my phone had a ton of missed calls, ton of messages, and I'm like, I guess the world blew up while I was asleep for two hours. <laughs> so when I finally caught up on everything, uh, realized what everybody was trying to get a hold of me about, I made contact with the uh, processing company that had the alligator on site and ultimately went up there and certified it and took the old former coordinator with me. Yeah, yeah, Ricky went with you. That's, I saw the picture that you, you guys posted. Tell me about it. Where was it? T give me some history on this on this alligator and who got it and how they got it. T tell us the story. So, uh, a hunter named Don Woods from Oxford harvested that alligator, and I knew that alligator once I looked at phone messages and listened to voicemails. I knew that alligator would mean a lot to to Ricky Flint because he and another officer tagged that alligator back in 2007 in Warren County. So that's been si 16 years ago. Wow. And so what do you know? What did, what, what did you learn from what, what they, you know, the data they collected 16 years ago? And then now that so, you know, this thing, tell me I about I don't it. remember the exact numbers on the length of that alligator when it was tagged. It was somewhere around 10 foot, 11, somewhere right in there, knocking on 11 foot. Um, so it grew, a, it, it still grew a good bit in those 16 years, but no telling how old that alligator actually is. What's your guess on it? What's your guess on the age? I, I don't even want to guess. <laughs> it can, I mean, it could be really old. It could be. Because the, the life expectancy for an alligator is uh, pretty tremendous, isn't it? It is. So the, the only way to be able to yeah. tell, the only way to be able to tell would be to pull a leg bone and actually send it to the lab. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so tell me about you know, where where did they get this alligator? Tell me a little bit more about the the experience that these got these guys had. Well, I'm pretty sure they're experienced alligator hunters. Uh, 
they do a hunting party and you know the party puts him for tags every year um i'm not sure if they get drawn every year but they've harvested some good alligators in the past but nothing like this oh really so they so they've uh they so okay so they don't the way this works though you snag it you can't you can't shoot it until you get it up next to the boat so that's that ex- th- that experience on a on an alligator that big had to have been incredible. Yeah, they so it was a couple of them, and they were using a fourteen foot John boat. And they said, you know, when they initially hooked him, and it was dragging them upstream, they said it looked like literally they were being drugged by another John boat. <laughs> oh, wow. oh man, what an experience! What what an experience! So so when they get an alligator that big, they still process it, and what 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 happens with it? They actually donate it to me. Mm-hmm. It'll, it'll go to some of the like Baptist children villages uh, and whatnot. Yeah. Hey, listen. Uh, we're at the end of this segment. We'll be back after this break. He's outdoors. It's Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi. Mississippi. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. I have uh, my friend Andrew Arnett, who's the head of the alligator program. And you may remember Ricky Flint was the head of the alligator program for so many years. One of many successful programs that are part of the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. And Ricky moved over to be the executive director for the Outdoor Stewardship Trust Fund that's had a terrific first year. And the legislature has set aside even more money for year two. So it's exciting to see where this program is headed. And uh, Ricky's doing a fantastic job in that new that new role. And I, I think it's great, Andrew, that you called Ricky because he had some history with that with that record alligator from 16 years ago. It's amazing that much time passed by, and that you included him in that. I know he was excited about it, but uh, but you almost broke another record, didn't you? We did. So I was out working the second weekend on Friday night, and that same processor called me and said he had the new state weight record. And I was like, no kidding. So two records first year, that'd be pretty awesome. And uh, he said it weighed, you know, around 100, 827 pounds. And I was like, well, that definitely uh, needs certified scales because that would have beaten the record by five pounds. So uh, I told him I'd be off the water. And once I got off the water, I'd head that way. I weighed that alligator three different times trying to get it above and it eight nineteen and a half is the the highest i could get it to weigh and it was missing the left front foot from about three inches above the joint so i do believe it literally missed the record by a foot <laughs> by, by literally a foot <laughs> by literally a foot <laughs> I wonder, you know, foot on an alligator that big is going going to weigh a few pounds, isn't it? I would think so. While I was there, I was just kind of picking up the right foot, just kind of trying to estimate, you know, how much does this foot weigh possibly? And I would guess somewhere around five pounds, just just guessing. Yeah, yeah, that's so. I, I'd have been, I'd have been. Uh, tantalized to cut it off and weigh it <laughs> just just know exactly you know what that was but you know that's a that's a testament really to the fact that the department of wildlife fisheries and parks has done a good job putting the alligator program in place and you know you've got a good handle on on the numbers and and you've got a good system in place where we can uh, we can know this kind of information that's that's what's so important about it uh, at a time, you know, many, many years ago when alligator was, we, we didn't know, you know, how alligators were going to come back or if they were going to come back and put a great program in place. And here we are. Um, and this is your first year in the in the seat as, as the head of the alligator program. Talk to me about well, what kind of experience has it been? Oh, it's been quite the experience. I literally hit the ground running and still haven't stopped. I have uh, reports to get to the Fish and Wildlife Service, reports for our agency. It it hadn't slowed down by no means. So any day I get to get out in the field, that's that's enjoyable. <laughs> I, I, I know I know it is. I know it is. Listen, congratulations on the first good first year 
and uh, maybe next year you'll get the length and the and the weight uh, record. I'm I'm sure we're headed in that in that direction because they seem to get bigger and bigger every year, don't they? I do believe so. We we got experienced hunters, and you know even new hunters are enjoying it and and doing the right thing. So yeah, that's 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 very cool. It's been great to catch up with you, my friend. Yes, sir. So now, now let's move over to uh, Larry Primo. L Larry is someone that I've been looking forward to uh, touching base with. He's gonna, we're going to talk about the K-9 uh, uh, team at the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. But before we get there, we'll get a little bit of background on Larry. But Larry, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing good. How you doing? It's doing, we're, we're doing really well. We did this, we made the transition. It's, you never know if we're going to be able to make this safely or not. We're using, um, you know, uh, Skype to, to do these interviews so that we can tape them for social media, for YouTube TV. And of course, we're, we're capturing the, the, the audio as well for, for the radio, of course, and then for podcasts. So there's a lot of technology we have to think about, and uh, and we made we made the smooth tr transition. So congratulations, Larry. Yes, sir. We're moving in the right we're moving in the right direction. Hey, listen, we'll we'll talk about the K9 program here in just a second. In fact, you're you're on the ground there in Perry County, involved in some K9 uh, activities as we speak. But uh, you know, tell me, how long have you been with the department? I started with the department in 2017. I'm a, originally assigned to Forest County. But I was a sheriff deputy way before, so 11 years before I made the transition to the Department of Wildlife. Well, that's cool. That's cool. I've heard a, a, a couple of others have done that too. It was a good, good, good uh, uh, training ground for you to to be able to come into this role, wasn't it? Yes, sir. I was actually a canine deputy for Forest County. Come to the Department of Wildlife. Never thought I would be a canine again, and here I am, seven years later, <laughs> with a dog again, starting a new, very new program. Well, it makes sense. It makes sense. Did they always have a canine program at the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks? They had one a long time ago. You know, Keith Bond was doing it, but I'm not sure when it ended. But since I've been, we haven't had one. Yeah. So had, had you always had an interest in dogs or why you were sheriff? Did you just kind of gravitated in that direction? So my actually my canine history started back in 2001 when I was on active duty military and I went to the the Army Canine School. So I was Army Canine Handler, got out of active duty in 2006, went to Hattiesburg PD, was a canine handler for Hattiesburg PD, and I made the transition to Forest County. So I pretty much, for the last 20 some years, have been, the canine has been in my blood. Wow, that's interesting. I, I, I noticed the time frame that you just mentioned uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, did, did your Army career take you around the world? Yes, sir. I've been to you know Middle East, Korea, Afghanistan. Yeah, that was a that was a tense time in American history, and uh, so so being sort of a, a a canine specialist in in the army, I bet there was a pretty significant role for you guys. Yes, sir. It was. You know, I was a bomb dog handler in the military, so you know looking for explosive aids was a big thing. I did a couple of presidential searches for President Bush in Korea. You know, I searched his hotel room a couple times. So it's always fun times. It's always fun working with a dog. You know, the wow, that sounds so, you just fly right past that like it's no big deal, but that, that's a that's a very big deal. You know, after Hurricane Katrina, I had the opportunity. I was a, a vice chairman of the recovery effort working with Haley Barber after Hurricane Katrina. In fact, I had the honor of writing the forward to his book, America's Great Storm, leading through uh, America, uh, uh, Hurricane Katrina. And uh, we, uh, President Bush came to coastal Mississippi 12 times and had the opportunity to, uh, to meet with him many of those times and got to know him pretty well, for a matter of fact. But one of the things that I'll never forget is that, of course, Katrina hits in 2005, the recovery efforts happening the rest of 2005 and 2006 and then beyond, obviously. But that's the, the concentrated time when he would visit. And I uh, was always uh, like blown away with how much care there was in the advanced team and the people who were around him. And uh, they, they didn't leave anything to chance when it came to the, the president's protection. You saw that in Korea big time, didn't you? Yes, sir, I did. So what, what a cool thing. And then when you went to the Middle East, still, still working with canines? No, when I went to the Middle East, I was just a regular old soldier. 
Yeah. Where, where did you go? Oh, I went to Kuwait, Afghanistan. Wow. Uh, interesting time to be to be there, man. Thank you so much for your service. Yes, sir. But it's uh, but it, you know, it, you get introduced to K9, and here you are now with the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, doing it still. And um, what is it that draws you to enjoy that line of work? You know, it's like having a partner that has a personality. You know, the dogs in the truck now behind me sitting, sleeping, yeah. on duty. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's always fun. You know, one day I was. They would tell people one day that dog's gonna need to go to um have counseling because how much as I've been to it. <laughs> yeah. So hey, to, what kind of dog do you have? I have a yellow lab. He's two years old. His name is Ranger. Uh, a yellow lab. So you, you tend to think of canine dogs being German shepherds. Is that is that is that normal that they would be German shepherds? Yes, yeah, sir. Most of your patrol dogs in the civilian life is you're gonna be Belgian Malinois or German shepherds. But the Department of Wildlife wanted a more of a a floppy ear, you know, German Shepherd, not German Shepherd, a yellow lab or a German shorthead pointer type dog. So we wanted the more where kids could come up and pet on them and stuff. Yeah, well, that's neat. So how would you guys at the department use a a, a canine? Well, I tell you what, I think we're coming, Cal, I think we're coming to the end of this segment. So when we come back on the other side, I'll ask you more about how we use the canines and whatever. But before before we get to the end of this segment together, um, let's. Uh, I'll usually ask because you're you're actually in a truck right now. I think or car. Where where are you, where are you doing the show from? I'm on my way to canine training. Right? Today for search and rescue training. Well, uh, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, I've had the opportunity to be Camp Shelby a bunch of times as well. Publisher of the Sun Herald. Do it, you know, watching war games. That, they're pretty serious there. That <laughs> can't be yes, that, that is for sure. What a great training facility. Hey, when we come back, we'll continue our conversation and uh, talk more about the K9 units with uh, Larry Freeman. We'll see you this right here. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. We're visiting with Larry Primo about the canine team at the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks here in Mississippi. And uh, he's actually on site now in Perry County where they're going to be doing some some training and some some you know games or whatever they do when they when they bring their canine team together. You know, when I think about canine, I think about a canine unit, obviously. You talked about that when you were with the Sheriff's Department. Of course, that's what you guys did with the with the uh, uh, Army. So now with the Department of Wildlife Fisheries, you probably referred to it as a new canine team. What, who, who's on this team? Tell me about that. So we have a, we're a four-member unit. It's myself. My dog's name is Ranger. I got Corporal Jones out of the Central Region. His dog's name is Canine Dempsey. I got a Corporal Starlin out of the North Region. His dog name is Charlie. And our South Region dog is Corporal Munner with Ricky. So the unit is, has three labs and one German head short pointer, which is all black. It's a very pretty dog, very hyper. You know, we had a big Facebook post last week where we introduced the team, the dogs. So all the dogs are around 18 months to two years old. And they're going to be spread out throughout the state for coverage on the state. Yeah. So, okay. So when you guys would get a call, when you get it, what, what, what's the plan for using this canine team? So a call will come through for like search and rescue or wildlife detection. If it's within the region, the, the handler can take the call and head that way. If we have to go across the region boundaries, the, you know, Captain Westerfield with the SRT will have to make that decision how far the dog will go and stuff. Wow! Listen, uh, there there was a there was a, a four year old down in the Red Creek Wildlife Management Area this weekend. Did you hear about that? No, sir. I was actually out of town during yeah. my army drill time. Yeah, so uh, I don't know the whole story, but a four year old kind of wandered off. It was, I think he lived in and around the Red Creek area and wandered into the woods and didn't come back. 
And so they called a search and rescue. How I learned about it is uh, my friend Terry, who I talked about at the beginning of the show, his his daughter Alex is my godchild, and her husband Logan is a CB, and they went to help look for this child, this four-year-old. And sometime yesterday afternoon, they actually found the four-year-old. One one of the CBs actually found the the, uh, four-year-old. So it's great to see how the CBs and others were utilized, and it's great to see there was a wonderful outcome to to that situation. But you hear that happening from time to time, and I can understand well how a canine could be really beneficial in a situation like that. Yes, sir. If once we're certified, you know, we're a newly formed team, so we're in training still. You know, you just can't take a dog and just release him into the public and say, hey, he's certified to find somebody. So this is a, a three-month-long school where each handler goes through it. We learn how to do search and rescue track in and wildlife detection. So once we're certified, we could have responded to a canine team to the scene of Red Creek and, and assist with the recovery of that, that lost yeah. child. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So you're at Camp Shelby now. What are y'all going to be doing at Camp Shelby? So this morning, we're going to do some search and rescue tracks. You know, right now, we're up to about 200 yards straight line. Well, you know, another handler runs into the woods with food in his hand, and the dog finds him. What we're doing, we're trying to transition where the dog thinks he's looking for his food, but in reality, he's actually looking for a lost person. Yeah, well, that's interesting. I mean... I can see how this is going to help dramatically move uh, the, the the capabilities of the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks uh, in, a, in a positive direction. It's got to be exciting being part of something like this. It is, sir. It really is. You know, with the, the four brand new canine unit, you know, we have a lot to live up to. We have a good team, and I think we're doing a really good job of training. You know, we're going to start on waterfowl detection today. You know, three weeks into our training school, these dogs have done picked up their odor. They're sitting on it. So today we're going to start putting out some ducks, start letting the dogs find the ducks odor, and we're going to keep going. We're going to, uh, hopefully we're yeah. ready for deer season, duck season, and come out and start assisting the local officers and, you know, the over-harvesting of our natural resources. Yeah. Hey, listen, <clears throat> one of the things that um, is – Kind of a surprise to me, but I guess now that I think about it, maybe not. You said that the dogs are somewhere between 18 months and two years old. Is that normal? Is that the normal uh, age of the of the of the uh, di- uh, excuse me the dogs? Yes, sir. You want to get you know you want to get that puppy stage out of the dogs. You don't want the dog chewing on stuff and you know playing a bunch. So these dogs are more mature now. They're older, and we should get about 10 to 12 years out of each dog. Wow. You know, all they're doing is search and rescue and wildlife protection. They're not doing all, all the other stuff a, a typical police dog would do. Yeah, and then part I guess part of the deal, too, is um, for the overall department, for officers that are on the ground all across the state, is to give it, giving them some training about when it might be a good time to call you guys in to help them on whatever the situation might be. Because it occurs to me that it could be a bunch of different situations that you might be able to use the canine unit. Yes, sir. Once we, you know, throughout the training process, I, I send up a weekly every week to the colonel. But hopefully in the next six, seven months, we'll get out to the, the regions and give the officers training, introduce them to. It's like I said, it's a new program. Many of the officers don't know about it yet. It's our job as canine handlers to get out and educate the officers and the general public on what we can do. That's, that's again, that's super interesting. You, you mentioned ducks. So, it, you know, search and rescue, obviously, but when you said ducks, it hit me. Now, how would it be used in a duck scenario? So, unfortunately, there's a lot of duck hunters that will conceal the duck breast in, like, the decoy bags or in a false compartment on the boat so they can take more than just the daily limit. So, the dog is there designed to find the, the odor so we can locate, you know, duck breasts inside a decoy bag or that false compartment in the live well or maybe in the, the motor concealed. Yeah. Wow. Ooh, good good for you guys, <laughs> I would say. You know, we, we, we really want to inc- encourage lawful uh, lawful taking of wildlife in the state, but we do know, and, you know, listen, 99.9% of people, that's how they do it. But there's always going to be that, you know, that bad apple in the group that's, that's trying to be greedy and, and break the law. And you're training your dogs 
to capture those guys. And I like I like the thought of that. I mean, same thing could be true for deer, really. Yes, sir. You know, down here in the south region, you know, deer are being hit in creeks. So they come back later on in the day when we're gone. We went home. They were skin them out and take them home, especially on the national forest with people are taking does and hiding them in like toolboxes and underneath dog boxes. So it's just a quick way for the officer to get out, run the dog around the vehicle. The dog indicates we can search. If not, we'll the hunter go. Wow, so interesting, man. I think I think that is a um, that is a, a great use of this canine unit. So as you as you four guys, you know, sort of get the training behind you, it occurs to me that once the officers get trained on what you can do, you guys are going to be pretty busy. Yes, sir. And that's that's the goal. We want to be busy. We want to for people to be reaching out to us and saying, "Hey, we need a canine here. Hey, you mind coming up?" to the Delta and working in detail with us. Yeah, that's neat, man. I mean, that's, that's what it, that's what it's all about. And just about, you know, continuing, <clears throat> excuse me, continuing the efforts of the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks to protect our wildlife legacy in the States to help keep our con conservation efforts moving in the right direction. But more, actually, even more important really is the opportunity to save lives, man. I mean, you think about, you're going to hear once or twice a year of people getting lost in the woods and some kind of search and rescue effort, like I mentioned about Red Creek yesterday. Um, what a what a what a great role to know that you can come into a situation like that and really help someone. It really helps save someone's life. You know yes, that sir. well, don't you? Yes, yeah, so you know when that call come out for a lost hunter, it's it's never the ideal weather. It's always super cold, raining. So it just helps us find the person quicker, get them out of that weather and stuff, you know, late at night. Yeah. Hey, I, I like your name, incidentally, Larry Primo. Pre, it's a, it's, a, it's a, you sound, it sounds like a movie star of some sort. <laughs> <laughs> but Primo is a cool name, isn't it? Yes, yeah, sir. I'm originally from Louisiana. Yeah, I, so, I figured maybe so. I listen. Uh, my wife's grandfather is from uh, s s South Louisiana. His he's a Melanson, and okay. you know, and, and of course, when he talks, he talks like this. He said, "Hey, <laughs> Bubba, brought that over here to me, yeah." I mean, yeah. that's 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 you know that well, don't that's you? That's my kin folks. <laughs> that's, your, <laughs> that's your that's your kin folks. You know, uh, people think of let's see, uh, 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 Bobby A. Bear used to be the coach. I mean, used to be the quarterback for the New Orleans Saints. Is I think from Cutoff, Louisiana. And yes, when sir. Bobby's on WWL over in New Orleans, you can you can you can hear that action in him. Yeah, man, he, you know he he really has it really thick. Hey, listen, uh, we're visiting with Larry Prima, who's actually head of the K9 team. And uh, when we come back on the other side, we'll uh, we'll we'll kind of wind up the final segment together. We'll see you after this break. I said, one Mississippi, there's a magnolia tree. To Mississippi where a mockingbird sings out on his limb Whistling that sweet soul for him I said three Mississippi to this land called home I breathe Mississippi till I'm dead We live in one of the best places in America to enjoy the outdoors. So let's talk about it. It's Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors uh, from the Foundation Studio right here on Biloxi's Back Bay. I'm really privileged to be here as we continue to celebrate the capital of the outdoors in the state of Mississippi. And I'm enjoying getting to know my new friend, Larry Primo, who is involved with the canine uh, team in Mississippi. Four, four, four men <clears throat> dedicated to the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, and their four dogs from ages 18 to two years old, and they're doing a lot of training. In fact, he's in Perry County right now as we speak at Camp Shelby 
uh, doing some some training, and they're going to be very intensively getting that team ready to go so they can go out and, and supplement the uh, Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks law enforcement side. And also, you really, you know, you, you never know where they're going to be called. Search and rescue, for example, is something that Larry and I talked about. And we were enjoying as we uh, went to break that he's his last name, Primo, is kind uh, kind of has that Cajun feel to it from South Louisiana. Turns out that's obviously where he's from. Uh, Larry, you know, where did you where did you learn the outdoors and to love the outdoors? Was it grandfathers, fathers? Where did that come from? So I, I learned a lot of my outdoorsmen from my grandparents. You yeah. Know, my, my grandpa was a big hunter, owned a bunch of cows. So I learned all my stuff that way. My dad, my dad's actually a retired sergeant major in the army. So we moved around a bunch when I was a kid. So we didn't get to a lot of opportunities to hunt, but when I was home with my grandparents, I did. Yeah, that's kind of my story too. My dad, my, well, I loved to hunt and fish with my dad. He worked a lot, and so it was my grandfather's, my mother's father, and my dad's father who I got to spend the most time amount of time in, in the outdoors with, usually fishing. It was just, it was pretty awesome. And now I get to share it with my kids and my grandkids, and that's 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 super special. And you you've got two boys, and uh, they're right at that age where they probably dream about it. Yes, sir. Well, my oldest is a big time hunter. You know, he shot his first deer about two years ago. My my youngest, who was seven, he shot his first deer last deer season, and he's he's pumped up. He's ready to go again this year. Isn't that isn't that cool, man? Isn't it great yeah. to be able to share that with them? You know, I can truly care less about killing another deer in my life, but taking the two boys out, watching them hunt, and learn how to do it the ethical way, it's it's a great feeling as a father. You know, we're big into duck hunting. They both love going duck hunting. We have a little black lab that we own, personally own, who's trained in duck hunting. We just like watching that lab work, shooting ducks and come back and just having a good old time. And isn't that awesome though? And it, listen, that's that's my story too. I, for about I, I don't know ten years or, or greater, I never even held a, a shot. I mean a a rifle. You know, my sons did the hunting. I sat with them. And uh, uh, was with my oldest son when he killed his biggest deer, really, really nice 10 point over 150 inch class deer. And, um, you know, was with him when he when he shot it. And of course, he was plenty old enough to be out there hunting by himself. But I kind of like tagging along and just, you know, just enjoying the experience with him. And now, now the same thing holds true for for being with my grandkids. But you know, I, I'll uh, I'll go out and hunt by myself. I, I like just watching the wildlife and you know getting in there and being still and seeing what comes up around me. I, I'm I've got kind of a reputation in the family for being lucky. Yes, <laughs> I see I see more bucks than anybody. I don't know why that is. You know, it's just it's just nothing but luck. You know, I mean, I I never pick the first stand. I usually wait and let other people pick where they want to go and. I'll take a look at what's left and go out and you know hunt somewhere with maybe a food plot nobody's been on for a while, and I take a lot of pictures and videos and they're just blown away with the kind of deer I see and what I pass on. It just they they often say they want people want to come with me and, and sit on my lap like a kid and just enjoy you know seeing some deer because that's what I get to that's what I get to see. But it's uh, it's so much fun to be able to really show that appreciation with your kids so that it, you're teaching them responsibility. You're teaching them the love of the outdoors. You mentioned, you know, teaching them ethical hunting. Um, man, there's, I mean, you're, you're literally teaching them about life, aren't you, Larry? Yes, sir. You know, it's not the hunt that I love. It's getting the boys out on the tractor and doing the food plots. That's teach them how to do food plot, you know, going out there making a nice duck hole. That's what, that's the enjoyable. <laughs> After the season's over, making duck boxes for the wood ducks and stuff. That's what I look forward to more than just taking them hunting. I, I agree, man. I talk about it on the show all the time that um, that the hunting really, at the end of the day, the hunting is kind of the, the cherry on top. But, you know, the cake's already baked, and that's when all the off-season activity that's taking place. And, you know, going in and, do you know, at the end of the season when the season's over and going in and checking out, you know, maybe there's some trails you didn't see and looking where deer activity is and how do we want to set it up different next year, maybe where we want to put some new food plots and then planning toward that. And, you know, I mean, there's, you know, it's a year-round activity if you look at it that way. If you're lucky enough to own land or lease some good hunting ground, 
there, there's plenty of work to be done, isn't there? Yes, sir. It sure is. You know, we own 90 acres in Perry County, and we have a lease in Forest County. Yeah, so that's... We, we go in and we we have a good time. You know, just the boys have the lot the lab in the back of the rhino and just riding. I watched my youngest son yesterday on the farm. All he did was drive that Rhino for six, seven hours. He was so dirty last night. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great, though? Man? You know, it hasn't rained here in about three months, so <laughs> that's yeah. what it does. That is so awesome. Listen, uh, Larry, good luck with the K-9 team, and I look forward to chatting with you soon as you, we as you roll it out and get the training all behind you and tell some stories about what your early days of the unit are, are all about. Yes, sir. It's been a pleasure. This has been Larry Primo. We've been talking about the K-9 unit, our team at the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Listen, have a great day, and God bless you. Stay safe when you're in the outdoors, and we'll see you next week.